One of the big questions uh, of our age, I think, is whether the internet is helping make people more informed. And you know, clearly, we all have a lot more access to information. But is that information turning into a better informed citizenry that's better able to make decisions about uh, you know, the important issues that we all face? And uh, at this point, we have a lot of data on this. And I think we can actually say uh, it's not really. And uh, you know, so Pew did a big study of uh, the differences uh, in people's informedness about foreign affairs before and after the internet. So they looked at 1989 and 2007. And uh, they found that on many metrics, actually, people dropped in terms of their ability to, in terms of their knowledge of foreign affairs. And that's really weird, because right now, you know, it's as easy to go to Die Zeit or Le Monde as it is to go to the New York Times. There's no barrier to entry here. And yet, uh, you know, the percentage of Americans who know the name of the Russian president um, has actually dropped by like 10 percentage points. Um, and of course, this isn't just a problem of uh, informedness about foreign affairs. You know, and we've all seen these studies. Americans are pretty poorly informed about domestic affairs as well, right? So 29% uh, of Americans can't name the vice president, right? 40% of Americans, 44% uh, can't define the Bill of Rights. Americans want to cut uh, foreign aid from what they think it's at about 30% to about 14% of the budget. Actually, it's way less than 1%, right? Um, and so, you know, we have this uh, this this real challenge of informedness. And um, when you get journalists sort of in a dark mood with a beer, um, which you know is hard, but somehow they do it. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, they'll say, well, uh, you know, maybe people aren't as informed as we, as we think. And, uh, you know, I think the, the most interesting um, uh, research that I've, I've read about this comes from a guy named Marcus Pryor, who looked at the shift from the broadcast era to the, uh, you know, to, to the internet era. And he looked at the way that that shapes sort of the distribution of informedness within a population. So in a broadcast era where uh, you know, there are three channels and uh, the news is on from five to six, you get this kind of nice bell curve in political informedness. Because if you totally want to know everything that's going on in the news, uh, your only chance to do so is between five and six. And if you don't want to know anything about the news, but you want to watch TV between five and six, you have to watch the news, right? And so there's this kind of leveling effect where everyone's sort of you know, clusters around the middle. As you move into an environment where there's sort of an infinite number of choices, um, you begin to see a really different curve. And you basically have a group of news junkies who know everything about everything. And then, uh, you know, actually, there's fairly steep fall off for a lot of the population. Because if you don't actively uh, find yourself in contact with news content, um, you could miss it entirely. And the median actually can then drift down uh, from where it was previously. So perversely, even though we have access to more information than ever, uh, people don't have it in their heads as much as they used to. So uh, you know, I think uh, we see this in the shift of, of where this information is surfacing. Um, I looked at, uh, you know, for, for a front page New York Times story, um, and this top one, uh, just devastating story, really important for people to know about, about, uh, about what, uh, a, a genocidal attack in Syria. This was on page A1. Um, and in the old information economy, that would mean that lots of people see it, right? But as we shift to uh, the news feed as a central place where information is surfaced, different information surfaces there. And so weirdly, you know, the Jerry Seinfeld letter to the editor on page A26 actually surfaces to way more people on Facebook than the page A1 story uh, about Syria. This is what this is, you know, sort of the, the the challenge that we're up against, and I think, you know, going back to those journalists around the the table, you know, a lot of them will say, well, maybe people just don't actually want this stuff, right? Maybe, you know, our maybe our audience just kind of sucks, and um, <laughs> you know, and maybe the future of journalism is the side boob channel, um, a real thing, by the way. Uh, I did not make this up. Uh, so, you know, or, or maybe Americans are just dumb, right? 
And uh, you know, I want to suggest that part of the challenge here is that in many cases, uh, those of us who care about surfacing public information have kind of stopped trying. And uh, you know, if you look at some of the headlines about some of the most important topics of the day, they really don't engage people who aren't already interested in those topics, right? So with new control, general to focus on withdrawal in Afghanistan, uh, that's actually a really big story about the future of the biggest, you know, one of the most expensive wars we've ever waged. But it's hard to like even get to the end of that sentence. Um, you know, Hegel confirms U.S. is considering arming Syrian rebels. Right? Again, this is basically like we're considering going to war, but uh, you know, but but it's it's hard to see that. And um, I, I couldn't help myself. I just had to throw in a few other sort of classic uh, headlines here. We have Congress returns briefly, which I think is a you know uh, not trying very hard. Um, and uh, it, my favorite, days light leaves signaling noticeable shift to autumn. Um, you know, so uh, I think you know maybe the problem is that we're just not actually taking our audience seriously enough. And so for the last year, um, I've been trying to test that hypothesis. And I got together with a friend, Peter Keckley, who is the managing editor of The Onion. And we kind of built a website called Upworthy that was designed to um, try to demonstrate that people actually do care about um, important topics if you, if you present it in a, in a palatable way. Um, and so our basic hypotheses were these. First, people have viral media wrong. A lot of people think that the only things that people will share virally um, or shareably or whatever you want to call it uh, is uh, you know kind of silly content about kittens and and whatever, and we believe that actually um, a lot of why people share is because they want to shed light on something that they really care about and that they really think is important. That's one of the most powerful motivators of sharing, and uh, it's really people kind of taking on this role as a kind of micro broadcaster and saying like, hey friends, we should pay attention to this. And we, we, we thought maybe we could tap into that. The second hypothesis is that contra a lot of uh, editorial departments, that really great editorial combines people and data and feedback. The third hypothesis was distribution really matters. It's not enough just to publish something. You have to get it out in front of people. And the fourth hypothesis was you know, that people actually really do want this stuff, that, that uh, you don't have to sort of force it down people's throats, that there's an appetite for it um, if you can get people in the door. And so uh, we presented these to a bunch of partners and investors. And frankly, you know, when we sat down with them, a lot of them said, well, good luck with that. Like, <laughs> hope it works out for you. Um, you know, but we, we, we decided to, to move together, to, to move on. And, and um, in March of 2012, we, we launched the website. And we basically focused on, on finding and packaging and distribution, distributing content that had three characteristics. It was visual, it was shareable, and it was meaningful. Meaning, uh, you know, if a million people saw it, they would come away with some better understanding of what's going on in the world. Um, that sounds like a very broad filter. It actually filters out about like 95% of the stuff that, <laughs> that you come across a, a lot of the time. And I should say right here, you know, what we do is not journalism in any kind of traditional sense. We don't pretend to be journalists. We you know, are in awe of the people who work day in, day out to create this information. We really were trying to demonstrate that you could bring it out to a large audience and people would actually bite. And so um, you know, we got started in March and uh, immediately started to see people really uh, begin to get interested. So in April, we had about 1.2 million people come to the website. And in May, we had about 2.5 million. We really started to feel like we were onto something. And it wasn't just that people were coming out. It was that the content that was doing the best was also some of the content that we were the most proud of. You know, we had that worry that like, maybe we're going to be posting sort of the very marginally meaningful stuff, and that's going to do really well. And then there's going to be the, uh, you know, the, the, the good stuff that we're proud of, and that's going to do poorly. But, you know, this video, which was a 13-minute video filmed by an African-American teenager about the experience of being stopped and frisked in New York City, not anyone's idea of viral media. This video, 800,000 people came and watched it on Upworthy, right? And in advanced chess, you can bring any combination of people and computers uh, to, to play chess. And at first, 
you know, the deep blues were totally cleaning up, all of the grandmasters were, were doing horribly. Then the grandmasters learned how to use the computers, and interestingly, the grandmasters with computers beat just the computers, right? That's actually better. But then the most interesting thing was that the best team was actually a group of amateurs who had access to the technology and were organized in a really smart way. And it was that combination of people and process and algorithmic tech that made this all work. And so that's really what we tried to build at Upworthy. We tried to build something that equipped our editors with really, really good feedback so that they knew exactly how people were responding to everything that they were writing. Not so that that would change what their editorial viewpoint was or what they were writing about, but so that it would give feedback to them about how to do it. And it was like you, know, you sent a bunch of comedians on the road with a routine that they'd never performed before. And all of a sudden, they were getting to see where are people laughing and where are people not laughing? What, how are people actually responding to this? And they got better and better. So uh, you know, our mantra here was uh, no great speeches to empty rooms. Right? Like It doesn't matter if you do the perfect thing and no one pays attention to it. You have to make people care. And uh, the person who really embraced this was this guy, Adam Mordecai, um, who, uh, and he probably wouldn't mind me saying this, you know, he was like a pretty good curator before we really started getting this data thing going. And after, uh, after that, um, he just like s soared. You know, so in the last couple of months, Adam has had um, over 30 million page views to content that he has curated, right? It's just an enormous, enormous number. And um, you know, it's often really good stuff that he's found. And it's because he's been getting this feedback. So we wanted to reward him. We did what I understand most media you know, journalistic entities do. We flew a plane over his house that said that he was an epic <laughs> internet king. Um, that was kind of our feedback to him about what he's doing. Um, so uh, you know, the third hypothesis was that distribution really matters. And uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, editorial folks that we talked to when we were getting started said, uh, you know, our job is to hit publish, and then, you know, and there was, it was never actually totally clear what was after those ellipses. Like, and then something will happen; people will come find it. Um, and we felt like, well, that's not a very compelling story. Like, we've got to go actually bring it out to people. You know, newspapers used to have like most of their people employed in the circulation department, and there were trucks and there were big printing presses. They would spend you know thousands of dollars like uh, for placement in a certain part of the newsstand, and all of that has like somehow been replaced by a single social media intern. Like, how does that make sense? <laughs> And uh, so we decided to put as much focus on the distribution piece of what we did as on the curation and the packaging piece. And we worked really hard to build this huge group of Facebook fans. So by now, Upworthy has 2 million Facebook fans. And what's cool about that is you know, it's a big community of people who want to lift up content that matters, who want to lift up these ideas. And the reach that they have is really extraordinary. So uh, when they share stuff, 59% uh, of Facebook is friends with one of them, right? And they can reach you know, two thirds, basically, of all of the people on Facebook if they share stuff. So it's this really huge platform for bringing things out, not just to like-minded folks, but far beyond that. Um, so uh, you know, what this has done, actually, is allow Upworthy, without any side boobs, to become a more trafficked uh, website than some of the biggest websites on the internet, right? Bigger than Hulu, bigger than people.com, bigger than TV Guide. And this is all content that we require has some kernel of meaning, that has some kernel of civic importance. So I think that's really exciting. And I think it suggests that uh, you know, maybe the truth, you know, people aren't uninterested in, in the truth. Maybe it just needs a bit better marketing. And I think as folks who are here because we're interested in lifting up content that matters and in informing the public about the things that uh, are going on in the world, you know, I think it's important to remember that our competition really isn't each other in this new social world. It's this, right? It's Instagrams of lunch. That's what we're fighting against. And uh, you know, we have to make our content as compelling as that. I don't know why that's so compelling, but it apparently is. Um, you know, and the interesting thing is, you know, in the consumer space, marketers have figured this out for a long time, right? They've figured out that consumers don't come to the market 
wanting a certain set of goods, that actually you can create an appetite for things that people don't actually need, right? So diamond engagement, engagement rings famously, you know, are a creation of the diamond cartel. They didn't exist as a tradition before they started being advertised. Deodorant, similar story, right? Like it actually isn't a natural thing that people naturally come to the market and say that they want. Um, and, uh, you know, to, 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 to put kind of a John Dewey spin on that, you know, what Dewey basically said was, Journalists, journalistic institutions have a responsibility for cultivating a public that is interested in this kind of content. We can't just expect that our job is to put it out and for them to come get it. We have to actually make it interesting and cultivate that appetite. And I think that's really the piece that we're missing today. So what does this look like when it's working? Well, it looks like this video, uh, which we curated at a previous, you know, sort of the, the beta version of this project. Um, it's not just that it got 17 million people to watch a really articulate argument about uh, gay marriage. It's not even that it allowed us to own the Google search term to lesbians, which is a fiercely contested Google search term. <laughs> it's that of the millions of people who came to, the, to see this, a million of those folks actually were really opposed to gay marriage. And so it was this place where this conversation started across ideological uh, bridge divides because of this shared experience of a piece of content. That's what I think is exciting. It's uh, this piece, which was uh, a video about uh, Goldie Blocks, this company that creates toys for young girls to become engineers. And uh, we helped get that video, its first million views. Of those million folks, 23,000 of them ordered the Goldie Blocks. And there are going to be 23,000 young girls out there who are going to have this toy set. That's pretty exciting. It's this video where uh, uh, Jennifer Livingston, uh, a news anchor, got this really nasty hate mail uh, from someone who was criticizing her body image. And she decided to stand up to that guy on air. She uh, did it on a Tuesday morning. We posted it on a Tuesday afternoon. Four million views later and two days later, she was on Good Morning America leading a national conversation about body image. And uh, it's this guy, Zach Sobrioff, who passed away a couple weeks ago. Uh, you know, he uh, was diagnosed with terminal cancer and told he had six months to live. And he's an 18 year, he was an 18-year-old guy um, and really wanted to be a, a musician. And so uh, some f filmmakers followed him around and created this really amazing 20-minute uh, video about his last six months, about his fight with cancer. Um, and you know, if you had to say, like, what, is the, what does viral media look like? It does not look like a 20-minute video about cancer, right? But, uh, you know, but Adam uh, found this video. And uh, even though it had been posted on people.com and it had been posted on foxnews.com, um, he felt like there was more, more interest there than those places were giving it. And he worked really hard. He ran 81 different tests to try to figure out how do we help this reach a large audience. He runs these 81 tests. He posts it on a Sunday night. By Monday, uh, you know, there are 80,000 people hitting the site to watch it every minute. 17 million people come and watch this video. And it's not just uh, that they watch it. They also donate over three hundred thousand dollars to, uh, you know, to, to support work on on cancer, and you know the video is about him wanting to be a musician. So uh, a lot of folks go from uh, the video to iTunes, where they order his song. It goes to number one on iTunes and becomes the only time that a non-major label artist has hit number one on iTunes. Right. So that's what's possible here. And I just want to close with the thought that I think you know, things aren't as bad as they appear in terms of forming, informing the public. There is this enormous appetite for content that matters. We just need to market those ideas a little better. Thank you. <laughs>